Welcome to the true history of authentic pile strain game fowl. In this video, we will be focusing on some of the different strains of pile fowl. I believe these breeds, as a pure strain, are lost to the ages today. I am sure some of the blood does exist in some fowl alive today, but the fact is there were never very many breeders of true pile game fowl to begin with, and most of the fowls died out fairly soon after their breeders passed. The reasons for this are many, but the prevailing reason is that the authentic breeders of pure pile fowl were bred by a very closed group that simply did not let these fowl out for their own reasons. And perhaps their children took little or no interest in their estate, but as a former breeder of a few very private breeds of pile fowl, I can say, as times and laws changed, interest with the relatives of these breeders changed too. And for the fowl, it was not good. I do not care for YouTube videos that take forever to get to the title subject because the creator's going on and on about liking and subscribing. So I'll just say hit the like button and subscribe. And that's all we need to say about that. So where did the name Pyle, spelled P-Y-L-E, originate from? In Old English game journals, the name Pyle is actually spelled P-I-L-E. This is supposedly a term to describe the red hackles and saddle colors that are, quote, piled on top of the white feathers. And over time, the spelling became P-Y-L-E. Now, this color exists in the entirety of the poultry world, from game bantams to domestic breeds. And in this video, we will not go into genetics very hard, but suffice to say the color pile in game fowl does not at all indicate whether the fowl are piles as a breed or piles only in color. Now, as an example, blue fowl will certainly will throw pile-colored fowl because blue fowl contain a healthy shot of pile in their background. But when you breed pile-colored blue fowl together, you will get at most about 50% piles, and the rest could be blue, black, splashed, or white. But when you breed a true dominant pile rooster, you will get 100% pile fowl, no exceptions. With that said, let's begin our journey with pile strains. I feel are what made pile game fowl a sought after breed for over 200 years. As I stated before, as a former breeder of pile game fowl, I was very fortunate to be able to exchange fowl with some of the best pile breeders in the United States and Ireland. These fowl came to me bit by bit early on and at no small expense in the beginning. My first experience with piles came after my father retired from service and bought 180 acres of unimproved land in eastern Oklahoma. As a young lad, I was exposed to game fowl through a friend and immediately fell in love with these feathered warriors. I saw such nobility in their breeding and beauty in their makeup and courage. I was determined to have some of my own. After building some pens and fencing an area amongst the red and white oak trees that dotted our property, I felt ready to care for some of my own fowl. My friend invited me to a derby at a local pit that was operated by a gentleman who had moved his family from South Dakota to Oklahoma. He brought with him his own fowl, which consisted of three breeds of piles and one strain of Kearney Whitehackles. I was very excited to attend my first derby, and I remember being so impressed with the beauty and quality of the fowl that were shown that evening. I watched minor blues from Henry DeLoach, a local fancier, who showed all colors from pile to dark blue, Jap crosses from the famous Sam Gowdy, rebel reds and grays also from just as famous Hugh Norman, brown reds from Roy Gray, even a few doms and travelers from F.D. Mingus in North Carolina, and the list goes on. But then into the pit walked a heavyset young fellow who was handling a show of the pit owner's foul. He carried a beautiful white rooster with red shoulders and yellow legs. My friend nudged me and said, hey, that's the pit owner's foul, and I ought to pay attention. The white rooster won the match easily and displayed the trace traits and, of course, beauty I was looking for, and I immediately knew I wanted to raise these fowl. After talking to the pit owner, I discovered he did not sell nor let his fowl out to anyone. 
I remained determined to obtain some of these fowl. Finally, after a lot of time and effort, the in owner invited me to his farm, and there I learned the breeds of piles he raised and his story about their history and makeup. On his yard were Jeanette Piles, Dan Tracy Piles, Doc Robinson Piles, and King Ranch Piles, which were, in fact, Janet Piles. I listened and wrote down every word when I returned home because I just didn't want to forget. And finally, one morning, a green 1950s pickup pulled up to the house. The pit owner presented me with a young trio of Jeanette Piles, with the understanding that they were never to be let out to anyone. If I lost interest or did not want them for any reason, I was either to destroy them or return them, no exceptions. And thus began my journey with pile game fowl that would last for 40 plus years until regrettably I could not keep them any longer. But enough of that, let's talk about pile game fowl breeds and their history. Few people will remember the name Harry Jeanette. He was associated with the ring of politicians known as the Tweed Gang in New York in 1869. Little is known about his life today except he was jailed for corruption, as was Tweed, known as Boss Tweed, and also Harry Jeanette escaped his jail at one time as well. So he wasn't the best of characters, I would say, but very high in the political realm at that time. Now, Jeanette bred and fought game fowl in the illegal East Coast pits of the day. The heel that was used predominantly were blunts, also known as pegalls, very short one-inch straight spurs. Jeanette also bred a family of fowl, dark red fowl, with yellow to carp legs. These were thought to be Earl of Derby red fowl, probably with some infusion of a willow leg type fowl. They could have been mostly dark red white hackle, exactly like the Earl of Derby fowl, which were in fact pure white hackles. Anyway, a family of long heel fowl in the South were making a name for some, themselves at that time. These fowl were bred from an imported rooster from the East. Some say China, Far East, I should say. They were solid white in color, including white legs and beaks, and a bright red eye. And these fowl were called White Georgians. Janet procured some of these White Georgians through his contacts and made a cross using his dark red Earl of Derby fowl. The result, after the selective breeding, was a pile strain that excelled in both long and short heels, also said to be the best blind fighters of their day. Jeanette did not sell fowl, much like everyone else, as was custom in that day, and the strain was held very private until his passing. There are probably no more than a handful of dedicated breeders by 1950. One of those was the pit owner who gave me my start with the Jeanette Piles. Another man was a fellow in Virginia, amongst others by the name of Carpenter, E.R. Carpenter, who sold fowl up until the early 70s. He bred Mahoney Gulls as well and Jeanette Piles. After much conversation, he sent me a trio of his Jeanettes and they were spot on Jeanette Piles. Over the years, they would be successful in the pit and very satisfying to raise. The typical Jeanette Pile was medium to high station, white with red shoulders to almost pure white with a few specks of red on the shoulders. Hens were solid white, legs were yellow to a carpy yellow green. Both the pit owner and I bred Jeanette roosters to red hens of a few breeds to create show birds. Roundheads, Kelso, Claret were some of the crosses. The result were always the same, 100% piles, straight comb. Never a red Wheaton pullet, never a red rooster. Now these Jeanettes are long gone now, but they were as good as any bird bred in their day. One of the most talked about and famous strains of piles were the real Dan Tracy fowl. More nonsense and misinformation has been written about and said about this strain than most families of game fowl. Although they are talked about in many articles, both old and new, the truth that I believe is the one passed to me by none other than the little Mick himself, Bob McGarity. 
When the pit owner I talked about previously decided to disperse his fowl, I was able to procure his last Dan Tracy piles, the rest of his Jeanette piles, and others including King Ranch Jeanettes and Doc Robinson piles. The Dan Tracy piles that I received were in no way what is seen or described on the internet today, and I firmly believe the garbage you see today contains not one drop of real Dan Tracy pile. L.C. Gano from Flushing, New York, of Pink Hatch fame, with whom I had several conversations with before he passed, had a version of Dan Tracy pile history based on his conversations and interactions with McGarity. Bob gave L.C. a start of Dan Tracy piles from the family that Frank Welsh, who was Dan Tracy's nephew, gave to Bob and his partner, a wonderful guy named Joe Massoni. Bob and Joe raised Kearney White Hackles and Dan Tracy Piles along with a breed of muff fowl. Bob was a dealer, car dealer, in Atlantic City, and Joe had the farm. Anyway, according to the version L.C. Gano told me, and also wrote in his History of the Pink Hatch, the Dan Tracy Pile family he received from Bob were not able to compete as a pure strain due to their small size and fragile makeup due to inbreeding, but they were so genetically wound that they were unbelievable for crossing. So that is why he kept some pure ones around. He also stated that they would produce a white leg gray stag occasionally because they contained a small amount of a famous gray rooster from Amsbury, Massachusetts that had won 17 matches. This gray was supposedly used to save, quote, the Dan Tracy piles as a family when Mr. Welsh discovered dogs one day had killed all of his stock except for a few males and a pullet. The gray was bred to the pullet and then over time was bred out. The pet, the pit owner, I'm sorry, was, had already told me his version of the Dan Tracy pile history. I would later discover he procured his Dan Tracy fowl from Bob McGarity. Also, I am 100% sure the version from Bob is more accurate than L.C., and I am certainly not bashing L.C., but he was in fact more of a fowl seller, they would call him a peddler today, than breeder. As I said before, L.C. Gano's version is readily available in this history of the pink hatch and can be viewed online today. What follows here is what I believe is the more accurate version. The Dan Tracy piles originated in Ireland, bred almost certainly from strains of piles from the English royalty down to landowners. A Royal Guard lieutenant by the name of Mansell had a successful strain that made its way into the cleric fowl. These pile families were all very similar and probably originated from the same strain. Bob was convinced that they were probably Spanish fowl in its origin or, or originally and they look very similar to Spanish fowl and have such similar traits. The real Dan Tracy fowl, as a rule, were not a large breed. Most roosters would be in the 4'4 four, four to 4'8 four, range, very, very seldom a five pound rooster, and when it was large, usually it was inferior. The real Dan Tracy fowl had a very powerful snap that seemed to get stronger as the match went along. Today, we call this bottom. They were very accurate and earned the reputation of having, as the English put it, the bloody heel. Dan Tracy, who later became a police officer in Newburyport City, Massachusetts, brought the fowl over from Ireland in the form of eggs. Along the journey, some would hatch, some would not, but that gave him the start when he arrived in the New World. In the very private and closed derbies of the day, the piles were very hard to beat and very successful. Sandy Hatch, later of Hatch Fowl fame, was said to have stated he never saw a breed of fowl win as many fights as the Dan Tracy Piles in Pegalls, which were short heels. I first became acquainted with Bob McGarity through my friendship with Carl Saya, Judge Carl Saya of Birmingham, Alabama, who raised roundheads and white hatch fowl. He suggested I contact Bob with the idea that we could perhaps exchange fowl, as according to Judge, Bob had the real deal. Bob and I developed a great friendship and exchanged both fowl and eggs from our Dan Tracy piles. It was Bob who told me that Frank Welsh lost almost all of his piles that day, but of only one family. He had four different families of Dan Tracy file, 
and crossed within these families to keep them fresh. The family Frank called his Butterfield family was what Bob and Joe procured, along with one stag and a pullet from the DuPont family. These fowl contained no gray blood. They bred these two families of Dan Tracy fowl and used them both pure and crossed with the white hackle in matches. I never received any of Elsie Gnu's Dan Tracy fowl, as he did not sell them, and I did not want them, but I later learned from Bob that the Dan Tracy fowl I received from the pit operator were in fact descended from Dan Tracy fowl given to the pit operator by none other than Bob McGarity. Probably no other fowl in history has been protected and kept private as a strain than the real Dan Tracy piles. These fowl were the darlings of wealthy game fanciers far later than you would guess. In fact, Bob sent me a cassette with over two hours of history of Dan Tracy pile information. Suffice to say, these fowl were kept by families of industry on estates that you would not recognize. They could not be bought. They competed along with other private strains in private pits that would resemble more of a luxury resort than a barn. I know of a few East Coast breeders who bred and sold piles from the same area that Dan Tracy lived in Newburyport and bred his fowl. In fact, one day I visited one while on business, Mr. Colby, in the late 90s before he passed away. He was a pleasure to visit with. I was not interested in the family of fowl he raised, as they simply were not the caliber of fowl that I had come to know. The Dan Tracy piles, the real Dan Tracy piles, were medium to high station, small and compact, hard bodies, much like an ASIL. Yellow and white legs and 100% straight comb. The roosters would be from pile to solid white, some with a speckle breast. The hens would be white with a salmon breast. And they would break high and had a powerful kick like a mule, were bitter game and carried that bloody heel. When crossed, they would throw 100% straight comb piles, no blue or red fowl. The Dan Tracy piles, the real ones are gone now. Perhaps a drop remains here or there, but certainly not enough to be the real deal. And it's really sad because they were one of the best game fowl strains to have ever lived. Now let's talk about Irish piles. The most famous strain of Irish piles was, of course, the Dan Tracy fowl. However, many of the strains of Irish piles eventually made their way to America. Piles were bred all over Ireland throughout the last century, each breeder adding or breeding his or her fowl as they saw fit. One of the breeders I became familiar with in the early 70s was a fellow by the name of John Tinian. I was introduced to John by none other than Elsie Gano, who had imported John's piles and white hackles from John's farm in County Tipperary in Ireland. At that time, the fowls came to New York, spent time in quarantine before Elsie picked them up, and then delivered them to his farm. The Irish piles were very good to Elsie, and John certainly shipped him good fowl. If you have any old game fowl magazines, chances are you can see L.C. Gano in his articles and ads. Anyway, these piles were no doubt descendants of the same English piles that were shown for so many years in England and Ireland. As I stated before, many Irish breeders raised piles. John Tinian and his friend Barney Mullen, from whom I also received pile fowl, raised both Irish piles and white hackles. Interestingly enough, both the piles and the white hackles had two very similar traits. They would both throw solid white hens and roosters, and they also would occasionally throw a rose or pecan. This is, of course, an indication of an influx of oriental blood, which in Ireland was very common to beef up their strains. The Irish piles I received from both Tinian and Mullen were absolutely fantastic fowl in every respect. They were extremely powerful, high breaking, and of course, very accurate. They were also a bit high strung and mean tempered at times, but if handled gently, they would calm down and eventually become easy to handle. This strain of piles is the one strain that was available to both the hobby and professional enthusiast alike. L.C. sold these fowl all over the world, and John Tinian sold many fowls outside of Ireland as well. I have exchanged Irish pile roosters and hens for breeding over the years from several places, including folks like Don Fike of Lower Valley Aviary in Arizona in the 70s, Brian Moore in Alabama, and John Holland in Pennsylvania. 
When Elsie Gano passed, his fowl were sent primarily to Pell City, Alabama, where they were sold out after a few seasons. I believe this blood exists today, but at what level of purity or quality, especially the ones from Elsie and John Tenyon, I do not know. The genetic makeup in the Tenyon and Mullen piles were wound very tight. These were very high quality piles when bred to anything, and they would throw 100% piles, colors ranging from solid white to white with red shoulders, sometimes a pink breast or speckled pink saddle. The hens were white, usually with a salmon breast. I never got any leg color other than yellow or white. Mine would rarely throw a pea comb, but I did breed one rooster that famously made the cover of the July 1976 Gamecock magazine. This cock was loaned in 1970 to Speck McLaughlin of Bull Rider Farms in, out of Texas, and he was bred for three seasons. I retrieved this beautiful white pile cock for LC and then bred him over a yard of my Tinian piles and returned him to LC where he remained until he passed away one fall day in his pen. He was 11 years old when he passed. Irish English piles have been instrumental in the creation of some great strains of fowl. No doubt they were used to develop the white hackle fowl made so famous by the Earl of Derby. Mike Kearney used Irish pile blood to beef up his white hackles and add more body cutting to them. Of course, everyone knows the Lieutenant Mansell pile blood that went into the making of the claret fowl. So strong that even today the clarets will occasionally come white. If one inbreeds good white hackle fowl to this day, they will eventually reveal their past by throwing a salmon breast or even a true pile color. As I said before, I believe this blood from Tinian, Mullins, LC exists today, but in what purity or quality, I do not know, and I would hesitate to think that it is in a strong quantity. There are other strains of pile fowl, but I believe the difference is in name only. For, for example, the famous blacksmith shop of the King Ranch in Texas, owned by the Klenbergs, bred a pile strain that was almost unbeatable, but these were originally Jeanette piles obtained from several private breeders, including E.R. Carpenter. Doc Robinson, who also had a very good strain of dark red hatchfowl, bred Jeanette piles but called them his own, which was entirely fair. I hope everyone enjoyed the video. This wonderful strain of fowl deserves its place in game fowl history, and it needs to be carried forward and not forgotten, as so many of our old breeds have been. Thank you for watching, and subscribe for new videos about famous old game fowl breeds of the past as accurate as can be had.